you hear a lot about attachment styles, really, really important um, kind of whole body of work that is is now has gotten you know pretty popular and you hear it in the popular um, narrative out there and and everybody knows what attachment styles are and they're talking about it most people do that follow that kind of thing um, but what's interesting to me is um, you know attachment theory has uh, been around for a long, long time before it got popular. You know, it's gotten really, really popular um, in recent years. A lot of books have been um, written on it, and it it it's gotten really usable in the way that it's gotten popularized. But where it originally came from. Um, was out of the work of John Bowlby and Mary Ainsworth um, way, 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 way back. I mean, we're going to like the 30s, 18, I mean, 1930s and early 40s and and at the Tavistock Clinic um, in London where they were doing a lot of, you know, a little history of psychology here. There was a whole British school of psychoanalysis that kind of, you know, split from you got you got Freud and then you got Anna Freud and then you got sort of um, Melanie Klein kind of went this way in England and and the Americans went this way and ego psychology and Heinz Hartman and all those people. Um, but they were really working on kind of little different aspects of the same body of work. Both of them, both sides of psychoanalytic thought have always, always, always been into the the topic of attachment. And there's a big reason for that. You know, starting with Freud and everybody after, everybody who ever studied human behavior knows that the nature and quality and style of your early most dependent times in life with your primary caretakers are where your wiring gets built of how you view this thing called relationship and more than how you view it, how the actual code is written into the, you know, neurology of your brain, which orders everything. And these early, early attachments we have in life or lack of attachments or screwed up attachments or healthy attachments really can set the, it's sort of like when you're, you know, your computer gets programmed, it's going to do what it's programmed to do until it's updated and the viruses are out of there. So this has been around a long time. And what Ainsworth did back in the, I'm going to guess you could go check on this, but I'm going to guess maybe the fifties or so forties. Um, and she came up with a model of four different styles of attachment. And if you have read any of the popular stuff, I don't get hung up on the words because um, people use different kind of phrases. And if you look them all up, this one says, these are the four, and this one says, these are the four. But broadly, they kind of fall into two big buckets <laughs> to begin with. There's the good one, <laughs> and then there's the three others. And what I want to talk about a little bit today, I'm not going to go into the particulars so deep of all the different styles and how they interact, but they do interact. And what you find in your marriage or your dating or your kids or, you know, your even work teams, that that there when you get certain styles coming together, they can interact in ways that sometimes are not good really for either party, particularly the one who experiences the most need. And it can be like, like fire and water, or it can be like water and water. It can be like fire and gas, or it can be like fire and fire, depending on which styles are interacting with which styles. You know, broadly speaking, you hear about secure attachment. And then the second one they talk about a lot is the ambivalent or or, you know, kind of anxious or, you know, worrying about it, preoccupied. Avoidant is the third one, or dismissive, they call it sometimes. 
And then there's the disorganized one, which Ainsworth herself kind of um, added because there's pieces of this and pieces of that. And, and sometimes it's hard to lump somebody into, you know, the anxious or the disorganized ones tend to kind of do a lot of isolation stuff. But I wanted to get in today um, what underlies all of it. Okay. Because no matter what style you are, and no matter what style the person that you're attached to or want to be attached to or attached, detached from, there's a big, big issue underlying all of those. Okay. A big, big issue underlying all of those. And this is what I want to focus on. There's two aspects to this issue. Now, basically, the bottom line of all of this, the very, very bottom of all of it is the human experience of need for the other. Need, need. You know what a need is? It's something that we don't have, we don't do well. You need water, you need food, you need air. Whether or not you need... Uh, Grade your iPhone or the latest thing. Not a human need. Humans do well for iPhones. But need, everybody has need. We don't, we can't do anything in life without our needs being satisfied. Now, a lot of people add a bunch of stuff to need, but our our basic need is the need for the other. Now, I wrote a whole book on this called Trust, because we are wired to be able to trust, and trust is the fuel of life, because if we can't open up, we can't get from the outside world what we need. We were not designed as self-sustaining. We weren't. If you got a belly button, that proves it. <laughs> from the moment you started, you had to be connected in order to get life. First, even inside of your mother, and then once you popped out and that cord was cut, that attachment was cut that was physical, and you didn't have to think about it, and she didn't have to think about it unless they were, you know, messing with it with drugs or something. It just works, all things being equal, until the cord gets snipped. Now, once the cord gets snipped, now that attachment that was physical, primarily, now becomes emotional in its mechanisms that have to drive the physical. The emotional attachment even drives things to, like in infants, you don't have early bonding, lower brain sizes, less intellectual development later, lower body weight, immune system problems, developmental delays, not from any, those are all physical things, and, and, and not from any physical thing, but an emotional attachment. And its emotional attachment is basically that foundational concept I talk about, about need. If I can't feel and experience my hunger for food without being scared that it's poison or scared I'm going to reach for it and it disappears or scared that it's going to fly up and be intrusive and hit me in the face, if I can't just eat, I'm not going to thrive. Well, every day we need to eat relationship. We need to take it in. But to take it in, we need to be not anorexic. And I used to treat a lot of anorexics and eating disorders. Back when I did, you know, a lot of clinical work, a lot of inpatient work. And anorexia literally means without appetite. See, if we can't have our appetite, if we can't feel our hunger, then we can't take in food. And what happens? We starve. Well, the heart is like that too. And so it all starts with need. 
And how do you experience your need for the other? That is the foundation. We need to be able to experience our need for the other in a non-conflicted way. And that's a big term, non-conflicted way. When we have needs, it's like a person with normal hunger cycles has a healthy metabolism and way of, what do they do? They eat, they're satisfied, they take it with them. The attachment, the food stays in there and feeds them for a while. And then they start to kind of miss and they come back and they get another refueling and we're taking it in and my food builds my body and my brain and all of that. And I can do life, but I have to keep getting refuel. Well, what if I'm afraid of my need? Then I don't eat so easily, or I'm picky. Or I might be, and we'll get into this in a second, I might become critical of food in general. It might poison me, or something like that. Or I get too picky where I'll only take from this little segment, right? <laughs> your relationship with your own needs is a big deal. It is a big deal. So I said there were two components to this that underlie all these three problematic attachment problems. The first is our relationship to our own needs. Do we have conflict-free experience when we need someone, when we need some connection, when we need some understanding, when we need some kind of feedback, when we need some kind of sustenance, do we, when we need comfort, when we need compassion, when we need fun, when we need sex, when we need all these needs that have to do with connection, we need to be comfortable with our needs which leads us to the second big problem. What is the software that drives the comfort button going on and off or the need being able to be expressed and invested freely, usefully, effectively, smartly, all that stuff. What is that software? Well, that software is basically in a relationship, and all of world is all of life is relational. It is the software. It is what is my image. So I talk about self-image a lot instead of self-esteem. Self-image, your picture of yourself and the picture of the other. Now, primarily what I'm talking about here with the other is I'm not talking about Joe versus Susie versus, you know, Tiffany versus Trevor. I'm talking about the software. What is an other? How do you, when it's related to your needs, how, what's out there? When you hit the need button, what do I expect from the person on the other side of my need? And how, how do I see myself and my needs? You know, insecure attachment, which is the good one. This is what you want to develop in your closest relationships and, you know, in a marriage or in good friendships. A secure attachment means... I can freely be aware of and feel my need for you and I can begin to move towards you and I can express it. And my picture of you is that you are going to be what the early theorists called attuned to my need. You're not going to gaslight it. You're not going to minimize it. You're not going to beat it up. You're not going to reject it. No, you're going to be attuned to it. And that relationship and that dance starts to happen. And as you are attuned, my mirror neurons and everything inside of me is going to open up more. And I'm going to allow more openness to receiving and taking in the love, care, support, nurturance, whatever I'm looking for from you. Take that in. Okay. 
But does my picture of the other say that? See, my picture of the other says, yes, the other in this software is attuned to me. They care about me. They're capable, able. They're really for me. They want this to feel good to me and for me. And they're developed a track record of being there, being available. Now, and this is very important, unless you want to become a borderline personality that has two others. There's the all good other and the all bad other. We also have to be able to sustain the picture of the other as having both good and bad qualities with a preponderance of good. What Winnicott, the famous series, also from Great Britain, he called the good enough mother. Mothers don't have to be perfect. Spouses don't have to be perfect. But you got to get it over on the side where their preponderance of what you're getting from them outweighs and neutralizes the mistakes. You know, sometimes the baby cries and mom's busy and they got to wait a minute or, you know, whatever it is. I can't come right now. And and they go all bad, but then they show up and, and that tends to make them go, oh, okay, she's fine. <laughs> and my mom's good enough. All right. So I feel secure. All right. So that's our basic wiring. Now, where do we get our wiring? Where does this software come from? And where does that code get written? You don't get a um, you know a, a a website to log into and download the program you know straight from Apple or Microsoft or somebody and it gets installed on the hardware perfectly so everything works. Well, actually, you did in real life. That's exactly what you got. I mean, it is exactly what you got in your early formative relationships where the code was being written what was being downloaded through your early attachments was the code of how you see yourself, your needs, and how you see others. So what does that mean? Well, it means in secure attachment, you were comfortable with your needs. You, wah, wah. somebody came and comforted you. Later, you needed help with your homework. Okay, I'll help you. They didn't beat you up. They didn't abandon you. They didn't criticize you. And now all the software, well, you know, you click the help button and the, you know, the right answer comes up. Somebody's there to help you. That's secure attachment. Well, <clears throat> you got ambivalent attachment, avoidant attachment, disorganized attachment. And I just want you to focus on, without going deep into the styles, that's not what today's program is, but it's pretty easy to figure out, you know, ambivalent. You're like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm worried, you know, I want them, but are they going to leave me? And there's a lot of rejection, you know, avoidant and dismissive. We kind of write them off and disorganize. You, it's kind of disorganized, but what underlies that? Well, let's take ambivalent attachment for a moment. See, with ambivalent attachment, there's two things going on. I said there's self and other. Ambivalent attachment, they are able, by and large, to feel their need, but they have need and fear kind of glued together. So when I experience my need, that automatically trips a fear of what? My view of the other, okay? And what happens is, in that view of the other, with the ambivalent attachment, I tend to see the other is very, very powerful and able to do what I need. But a lot of times with ambivalent attachment, my view of myself and my own needs are kind of negative. I'm rejectable. I'm not good enough. <clears throat> I'm not smart enough, pretty enough, my needs are overwhelming to them. You know, there's some sort of, there's something wrong with me. <clears throat> and in my early experience, 
when I wasn't connected with, the preponderance of it, I tended to get in my view of myself. But what happened actually in the relationship was the attachment didn't go well. So there was something wrong with the other as well. In fact, I've worked with you know people as they're healing from ambivalent attachment. They've got to get good at beginning to see others realistically and also begin to spot the ones that aren't available and are gaslighters or narcissists or, or, you know, ambivalent towards them or whatever, and learn to differentiate and learn <clears throat> there are some people out there that will love me like I am and I am lovable. And how do I know that? Because now I'm entering into new experiences and they're proving that to me. Generally, please hear this if you're single or even if you're married, Generally, attachment styles, generally speaking, have got to be repaired in non-romantic relationships for 8,000 reasons. First of all, in especially a therapeutic relationship, which is non-romantic, you're not going to date and get married, hopefully, unless your, your therapist is really unethical. They're there to be secure for you to need and experience, and they're going to respond to you well. And because in romance, both people need each other in all sorts of ways, and there's so much insecurity that, and sometimes, especially in the dating world, it's not even, you know, they haven't even signed the papers yet, right? So you, you got to heal this in some sort of a support group, therapy, a couple of friends that aren't going to go away. And then you learn to have your view of yourself as my needs are okay. And I don't need to be afraid of them. In fact, I can express them. And my picture of the other is they're going to be there for me. And they're not going to be perfect. They're going to be imperfect. Sometimes they're going to frustrate me or not be available. But overall, it's good enough. And that only comes with rewiring it through time and through being vulnerable and getting responded to and all of that. And then later, the differentiation between the, this is why we wrote a book called Safe People. Very important to understand who you want to need to attach to and who you don't. Really, really important. Okay, well, you go to the avoidant, dismissive. You know, I said the ambivalent gave a lot of negative views of yourself. Well, avoidant and dismissive people, <laughs> who am I going to dismiss? Well, they're not good enough. Tend to have a devaluing negative view of others. Now, underneath all of this is their needs. So their fear, when they start to get close or maybe get interested, if you've ever dated one of these, it can be a nightmare because they can come on in a whirlwind and then all of a sudden, turn into avoidant and dismissive and you're no good anymore. But wait a minute. I thought he or she really liked me. Now you got ghosted, for example. But it's the need that started to wake up. See, we get sort of interested and close. You start to invest. But then they start to feel afraid very unconsciously a lot of times. And as soon as that fe fear begins to activate around the need, remember I said those are merged, the fear triggers your basic, what, fight or flight. So they go away. Or they become fighting in negative criticism and things like that. So underneath that, what you've got to do is you got to become comfortable again with your needs. And when you feel them, stop devaluing the object of your need. One of the, I worked a lot, a lot when I did a, a lot of clinical work, a lot with borderlines and narcissistic personalities. And you've heard me say many, many times, you always hear, well, they can't change. That's so wrong. They can change with the right kind of therapy and the right kind of investment in therapy. Not all of them do because it's hard to get that. But when you do, yeah, there's great hope. 
We've been treating this. I mean, the the foundational work in this was done way back in like the 70s and 80s. So this is not something that people haven't known how to treat. But one of the things you always saw when I, when I treated them a lot was something called devaluation. And as soon as they start to need a therapist, what they'll do is they'll devalue them. And now you're not good enough. Well, you didn't respond to me. And you're this and you're that and you're that. And, that. and one of the jobs of the therapist as the other is to help that person reorganize their view of the other as not all bad just because I didn't call you back on time or just because I didn't respond to you in the way that you wanted to be responded to. Remember, I'm the same one that you loved yesterday. You thought I was really helping you. Remember that? And we got to get these good enough views back in. And, and that happens in a lot of marriages. You got to work on that developing the view of when negative things happen and frustration happens, devaluation doesn't kick in. And that's underneath a lot of this need fear. Because when the fear starts to happen, why? Because the need is starting to be expressed and invested in. Fear kicks in, devaluation of the other happens, and boom. You're abandoned in a dating relationship, in a marriage, in a friendship. So all of this stuff is connected to people's experience of their need for the other, and it's connected to their views of the of themselves and what the other is. Now, after you get the foundational wiring kind of hooked up, where it's okay for me to need and my needs are good and I'm lovable. And there are others out there that will respond. And I experienced that we get over on the, you know, if you think about the sort of the fulcrum, the seesaw, now we're over on the other side where we're kind of experiencing life more in the secure attachment realm of humanity. Then you learn to differentiate because guess what? All people are not the good guys. <laughs> they're, they're not. There are gaslighters and there are abandoners and there are rejectors and there are avoidance that will blow you off and all this kind of stuff. So we'll only be able to see that accurately from a secure position. Because when they're in when we're in the insecure position, our view of self and others keeps us from seeing even people realistically. I've I, I've seen so many marriages where one of them is the most loving person, the most faithful person, the most committed person, and the other one is always accusing them or not trusting them or you're going to leave me or you did this or you did. None of it is true, but their view of other is what's driving that. So. Hopefully, some of that will give you some things to think about as we talk about um, this whole attachment thing. It's good to learn your styles. We've got stuff on that on Boundaries.me and all sorts of things about um, back when I first wrote my first book called Changes That Heal, where I go deep into the attachment issues and the symptoms that it causes in all sorts of relationships and clinical issues and all of that. Back then, <clears throat> before we started using the word connection much, back then we talked about bonding. And it's the same thing. It's a bond. It's an attachment. <laughs>